basically, uh, I want to clarify, I suppose, the role of collage in my painting practice. And I guess I'll start by saying that as a painter, if I had my druthers, what I paint is maybe architecture, maybe some text, maybe atmospheric phenomena like clouds or maybe rain or something like that, and light. Uh, I don't paint generally living things, animals and people, and I don't paint plants. Um, so that's what I usually would paint. Even that is a maze. So it's a piece of architecture I've seen from above. So that's sort of what I, what I paint. And I started using collage. Um, so maybe the earliest collage is 20 years old. It's probably one of the first works of art I made uh, earlier than, let's say, this painting. And I once read a book about the history of psychology. And the author was saying that in discourse, psychological discourse had like three different stages. There's a folk discourse where like people all together kind of figure out how, how psychology works over a long period of time in like a folk discourse. And then there's a philosophical discourse where an individual person like Plato or something like that would try to figure it out himself using a tool like logic, right? So we'll try and do it faster than the folks could do it. And then there's a scientific discourse, which is like a synthesis of those two discourses. Because you've got lots of people over a long time figuring it out, but they all use logic to do it. So like that's even better. And I thought about the discourse in painting is probably more of a philosophical discourse where each painter tries to figure it out themselves. And I wondered how painters could collaborate. Because imagine like chemistry or something. If no chemist could ever refer to any other chemist's work, then they could never progress, right? But I couldn't really figure out how painters could use each other's work or refer to it. But photography seemed like an easier way to do that. Because with a photography book, I could actually have possession of the photographer's work. Um, you know, in painting, if I were to paint a Renaissance painting, let's say, and then put an X over it because I don't like Renaissance paintings, the energy it took me to paint the Renaissance painting is a hundred times more powerful than the energy it took me to, to cross it out. So that, that hurts painting's ability to kind of be critical. But collage, I can bring this other artist's work into my work really easily. And even with light gestures on my part, they can match the lightness of having appropriated the work, right? So that was why I've always done collage ever since I first started painting, like alongside of it, because it kept me thinking about collaboration that seemed maybe impossible in painting. Um, also, I always thought that what we used to call identity art was maybe the most important provocation, like postmodern provocation, to modern art, in that modern art had this conception of the self that was authentic and individual. And, you know, so like one expresses art, which the word express means push out, one expresses it from one's authentic inner self. But identity of art had this idea of a self that was shared and external and kind of objectified. So I thought that that was this um, important counter to kind of modernist thinking about the self. But most identity art at that time, like you know, 20 years ago, there was an idea of, if I may say, a kind of native informant the idea that the artist was maybe a marginalized person who would then tell the center, report to the center, about their marginalized community. And that seemed like a limited conception of an artist. And I realized that photography, um, the photographer wasn't so much a native informant. They were more like a spy. So like I would read about uh, these white women photographers, <clears throat> and they wanted to photograph like a group of people in India, 
and their method of insinuating themselves into that community so that they could photograph them, then take that back to the center, and then they could go somewhere else. So that seems like more fruitful. I always think of uh, the scene in the, in the Running Man. I think it is not, let me think. What's the one, it's, it's Dustin Hoffman, and he's, uh, there's like a Nazi, and he, Marathon Man. And the Nazis got him, and he's saying, is it safe? And he's torturing him. And Dustin Hoffman knows that if he tells him the information, he'll kill him after he tells him the information. So that was what always made me think of being a native informant. Like at some point, you run out of things to tell them, and then, you know, what happens then. So the, the life of a spy seemed more uh, secure in some way. So collage has always been moving, moving along with uh, my painting. I was reading a, an interview with uh, Louise Bourgeois, um, Robert Storr, and he asked her uh, why it kind of took so long for her work to be appreciated by other artists. And she said something that I think is interesting about the nature of art. She was saying that the radical proposition were anti-establishment propositions in her work um, were better kind of absorbed by a later generation than by her contemporaries. And I think that the reason that happens, like when I think to my childhood in the 80s and 90s, and I think about like romantic comedy movies or any kind of movie, and how homophobic and uh, racist and misogynistic they were. And if I got the time machine and went back there and walked into the Hollywood studio <clears throat> and suggested that we make a movie, a romantic comedy, that was not about like sexual harassment, it's not that they would disagree with me. My proposition would simply be illegible to them. They would have no idea what I was even saying. And I think that. Uh, that sometimes time is required to create legibility. And I say that standing here with work that maybe I did 20 years ago, 10 years ago, I remember when I was on a show at the Studio Museum, Frequency, curator came into my studio and I was like, you know, I'm proud of all the work, you can take whatever you like. And she chose these collages I did from a book by a white woman photographer of uh, people in Africa. And I think the reason she chose that is because I am black, and those were pictures of people in Africa, and so that made sense to her in some way. But recently, a couple years ago, the Studio Museum uh, was buying a painting of mine for their collection, and they had a choice of two paintings. Both were paintings about people who had died by hanging. One was uh, Sandra Bland, a black woman who uh, died under mysterious circumstances in police custody, right? A mysterious kind of suicide. And the other was a white rock musician who uh, committed suicide, uh, maybe with the Foo Fighters. And you would assume that they would have chosen the Sandra Bland painting because that would have been more legible, why I would have painted it. But they actually chose the other painting. And I felt like that was an instance of me seeing legibility because I don't know why they chose it. There could only be two reasons. One, they actually liked the painting better. Like they were like, oh, this is the nicer painting. Which I think, I'm, I, I was perfectly happy with that answer, right? And two would be, they realized that I do stuff like that. And that if you were to get a Mike Cloud painting, you would get a painting of a white person rather than a black person, which would still, is like an issue of legibility uh, that didn't exist 15 years ago or something when they first were interested in my work. So um, I'll tell you the process. The first collages I did were the ones on cardboard. I took this book, Diane Argus, and I looked through it many times and tried to figure out who the people were she was, she was making photographs of, like, archetypically. 
Then I tried to reproduce the archetypes in collage. And I like the transformation to painting, or it suits my ethics better, because it was like I would make this image of, of a dwarf, but one person didn't have the burden of being the dwarf. It was sort of opened up, like I created the dwarf and, and relieved them of that pressure. So that was that group of paintings. The, these collages were made with the same principle, but I was more careful of the parts that I was leaving behind. So the first book is just all cut up, but the second book, when I cut pieces out, I would fix them, and I would fix them using text from the book. But I was still unhappy that the work was two things, so the quote collages are my next iteration of that. So the entire book is there, except the cover. And I got like four copies of the book so that the front could be the same as the back. Um, and then I wrote the Annie Lewis's name on it. Because that was as close to kind of painting as I can get. I feel like that does the things that a painting does. It's like it's frontal and it's signed and it's dated and those sorts of things. And I hadn't painted for maybe two or three years while I was working on those. And those kind of taught me how to make a different kind of painting that is broken up into pieces and fragments and I can do one thing here and another thing there. So those collages kind of led me back into painting. Um, and I think that that's, I'm kind of embarrassed about uh, telling you about the art form as <laughs> that, that interview with Louise Bourgeois, um, Robert Storr asked her, why did you start like using sculpture in a uh, kind of installation mode, right, in the world? And she said, when I, you know, I, I left my family, I abandoned my family in France right after World War II, or maybe it was like during World War II she left in here. And she felt something like shame for that. And so the installation mode was a way for her to bring her family uh, into the room in some kind of a way. And so whenever you ask somebody why something, there's more than one way they can answer. Her answer was about her motives. You know, motive comes from the word emotion. So she told you what she was feeling and also her goals. And you can answer questions in other ways. So um, I struggled to tell like how to answer a question of why with those uh, ad pieces. Because unlike, well, or maybe just like the music you are, all of my motives are not good. You know, like I have negative emotions and I make hard out of uh, so that one is probably, uh, if we stick with the traditional seven deadly sins, that one is a little bit of envy, right? Uh, I mix up the people's names, but if they're famous enough, their names are still legible. And uh, I add my own name. So it's still about collaboration, like how does one have colleagues as an artist? You know, when, when we're, it's all, there's kind of a demand that we each stay in our own lane or, you know, don't resemble each other. Uh, yeah, so I'll stop talking there and ask if there are any questions. I have a simple question, but maybe not simple answer. What's it like to stand in a room with your own world? This isn't so retrospective in that it doesn't feel like 20 years is between any of the pieces. Because they're very simple gestures, all of them. I could have made them all in the weekend, probably. Um, so that feels good. Uh, I make all of my work by hand. So, you know, I made that painting 15 years ago, maybe. And I intended to make another one. And I still intend to make another one, but I just don't have time because I'm doing other things. 
So that part feels good, because it feels like being back in my studio and being reminded of things that I meant to keep doing. You know? They say that uh, in the Bible it says that the kingdom of heaven is like a man who finds a treasure buried in a field, and he goes home and sells everything he has and goes and buys the field. And I kind of feel like that with art. Whenever I have a new idea, I just run home and sell all of my old ideas, <laughs> and then I go and I have this new idea. And so it's, it's this is like a, nice to see all of these old plots of land. And I guess it's sad because I thought there was a treasure in every one of them. <laughs> but I think I've got it this time. I think I've got it. Uh, 
we would be able to recognize that in each other's work. Yes. Do you have any thoughts on the You know, when I was young, I was an underserved inner city youth in Chicago, and I had to paint murals, and I absolutely hated it. I, I didn't think I ever wanted to be an artist, and especially I didn't want to be a painter after working on the murals, because I could do it because I have talent, right? But the worst thing about the, the murals is that, like, if you made a mural like a zoo, you painted the animals that were sitting right there. You know, if you did a mural at a community center, you would paint people in the community or the community center that is sitting right there. So it was in psychology, I guess they call it mirroring, when you tell somebody who they are and what they look like. And it's a form of manipulation, right? So um, so I do not enjoy <laughs> painting murals. <laughs> or, and I feel like public art does that a lot. It does a lot of mirroring. Um, and I, and I do collaborate with my wife, um, maybe in things that are writing. So we've collaborated on some writing things. Yes. I was intrigued that you said you had been thinking about making another painting like this, but you didn't have the time because you were doing other things. So please tell us what those other things were that were more important than doing other things. Glad you asked. Um, All right. So I figured that the portraitists, people who paint portraits, because I don't paint people, right? But uh, I think to engage with the real issues of today, I kind of need to paint people. So I've been worried about to figure out how to paint people. And I think one thing that the people who were the greatest portraitists from a little while ago. Let's say um, Lisa Yuskovich. They have a subject, let's say it's female sexuality, and they develop a mode of portraiture that has that subject built into it. And the downside of, and, and that made a lot of sense, like in the 90s or something, or the early 2000s. Or my drawing teacher when I was an undergrad, Carrie Marshall. He paints African Americans, and he has a mode of painting that allows him to paint African Americans the way he wants to. Or Mickalene Thomas, who uh, was a, uh, a colleague of mine in school. But if Lisa Yuskovich wanted to paint someone who she didn't find sexually attractive, like um, I'm looking at a portrait of Adelaide Stevenson, if anybody knows who that is. Her mode of painting would not allow her to paint the person. Or if Terry Marshall has goes out to lunch with a with an, a young Asian woman, and he has a great time, and he wants to paint her portrait, his mode of portraiture won't allow him to paint. Her. It's sort of like if you built a camera that only took pictures of cows. And if you took a picture of anything else, it would just show you the last cow you would see. <laughs> but what you don't understand, because the past is a foreign country, that actually made sense in like the 90s or something like that, especially for marginalized people. Like a feminist utopia in the 90s was a world only occupied by women. Like that's how you would know that a person was painting a feminist utopia. It's because there are only women. Um, and so for, you know, in my household, when we would buy Christmas angels, we would paint their faces black. They would be, they would come in the box white, and we would paint them black. We were kind of making a black utopia or something like that. And it would make sense that in a black utopia, there would only be black people there, I suppose. And that made total sense in the 90s, early 2000s. But then when, I think we were prefiguring a thing that we, nowadays we call the algorithm, the algorithm is a, is a generated world that is full of only the things you like. And the computer looks at what you do. So you can't lie, you can't trick it. It looks at the things you do. It knows what you like, and then it fills the world only with those things that you like. 
And so it seems like such a dangerous thing nowadays, even for a feminist utopia, to only have women in it. Um, because what it implies is that you could not have a feminist utopia that was only 52% women. And that means that we are not in a feminist utopia right now because there are men here. So you can't have a black utopia where there are white people, which means that we're not in black utopia right now because there are white people. So there's something, like somehow, it, I think that art is always an advance in itself. And it's good ideas become bad after a while. You know, when, when the world catches up to us, to our good ideas. So I'm working on a painting right now. I finished the portrait of Adelaide Stevens. And I'm working on a painting of the first Thanksgiving. Uh, and some other group portraits of like people's lives. Uh, because the actual world is infinitely diverse. The actual world has black people in it, it has white people, it has fat people and skinny people. Uh, it has spaceships, it has earthworms, it has all those things. Uh, a painter cannot capture all of that uh, diversity in a picture because the world is not a picture, so I can't translate it into a picture. So I have to edit in order to make pictures. And it's logical to edit by simply using the things I like. That's perfectly logical, it's logical in this limited world. Like people will make paintings that are only Mexican food because they like that whatever. Um, but it seems like that good idea has become bad. Like that good idea is somehow scary to me now. Uh, and so I'm working on paintings. Oh, but and there also is an ancient tradition of making pictures of the entire world. They're called cosmograms. And their ancient uh, strategy of depicting the entire, entirety of reality using abstraction. Uh, so that's what I'm working on now, and it's why I'm too busy to make another one of these paintings as much as I would love to. And I'm too busy to make another quilt painting, although I've started one, but I'm too busy to finish it right now. So bad enough, that was... <laughs> Basically, you work with one thing. That's my. <laughs> that's all I needed to say. I work on one painting at a time. I work on another. <laughs> Great. I think that a response to a lot of the different things that you brought up. You brought up a lot of things. And I have a really clear question. But it seems a lot of the art, a lot of the ideas you work with, is what you just called what seemed like a good idea at one time. Doesn't seem like a good idea now, which is to be broader. Yet a lot of that you might see described by technical ideas. You work with a lot, in my mind, you work with a lot of fixed categories. Like, I don't understand how a cleaner is going to make another cleaner. Well, does that give precedent? You know what I mean? Artists don't just make stuff up from nowhere, they always have something in mind. So, how is it that if, when you think about painting, it seems like you're always thinking about the category of painting? This is a conversation I have with a lot of artists, right? Like, I'm going to use painting as this thing that's already been fixed. But at the same time, you say, I see artists' work and I can see the studio practice in it, which is say there's fluidity in what they're doing, right? It's, it's not a fixed category. So that's more a response, it's not a question. Fair enough. And, and there's no reason for me to respond to your response. Your response is entirely reasonable. I suppose I would say, I'm a kind of a warrior work. And I guess it concerns me sometimes. You know, acknowledge, the word acknowledge, the prefix act, it means to admit or to recognize that you know something. And when we say, like, let's go dancing tonight, we all know what dancing is. Right? So when we say, um, let's have hamburgers tonight, we all know what hamburgers are. There is some looseness. For example, like some veggie burgers are just a mushroom on a hamburger bun, 
right? But it still participates in the discourse of hamburgers because of the hamburger bun, and maybe if you put ketchup on it, it participates in the discourse. Uh, other veggie burgers are just made out of chickpeas and so forth, but they still participate in the discourse of hamburgers by being flat and by the way that you dress them and so forth. Um, so it is, there is a fluidity. But I guess artists are very smart, like we tend to be kind of intellectual. And I think intellectuals tend to be, dare I say, deceptive. Or subtle, maybe, would be better. Um, we're capable of disguising the things that we know and believe, right? So I do, I am concerned that some of that fluidity is just us disguising the things that we know and recognize. That painting is a discourse that things participate in more marginally or more centrally. And it's better to say that it isn't and that we don't know and so forth because it feels freer. But I, but I don't know if, I don't know if A, that is even a reasonable proposition, um, or B, if I actually see it in anyone's practice sincerely. But this could be one of those instances where in 20 years, that proposition will be legible to me. Because uh, right now the proposition is illegible, but uh, yeah, but maybe it will be. The proposition that there is no category of painting, or that works of art don't have meanings. I don't know if that's what, what I meant. It probably isn't. <laughs> Should we'll always try to understand each other in the most reasonable way. Other questions? Yes. How does teaching this You know what? Like I said, if I had my druthers, I would just make big paintings of atmosphere, right? Color and atmosphere, a cube, maybe, maybe some text, maybe some clouds in the sky, light coming through. All kind of abstract. But my students they change every four years, five years, and they come in with like problems, right? So like this student came in with this problem, she was a uh, Chinese American, and she was making identity art in a way. She had chosen a group of Chinese immigrants in California who had been murdered, you know, they had been lynched by white people in California maybe 200 years ago. And she was making work that was meant to evoke the, the, the correct kind of aesthetic, which is maybe mourning, uh, maybe something else in that realm. But the thing she was running up against was she wasn't, like, she wanted people to feel the proper feeling, even if they did not identify with the people. They didn't identify with them maybe because we aren't the same nationality, or they didn't identify with them because it happened long ago, but she wanted them to still feel that kind of, uh, connection. But she wasn't, as an artist, modeling that connection. She had chosen those people because she identified with them. She was Chinese and they were Chinese. So how could that work past that identification? And I talked to her about it, and she had her ideas. She's much younger than I am. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to try. I'll try it myself and make a painting. I made a painting of a Korean woman who was killed by a serial killer in the 1980s to see if I could make a work past identification, basically. And so that's how kind of being a teacher works in for me. My, my students kind of frustrate me sometimes because they have problems that are interesting problems. And I'll say, well, why don't you go in your studio and like make a painting and see how it works. Uh, do an experiment. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Um, but I always do it myself when it's like an interesting problem. So without my students, I don't think I would have those problems. You know, and I would just be making that painting of a cube and some text in an atmosphere. And sometimes when I pursue those problems and those solutions, it doesn't work with the first painting, and then I have to make another painting and another painting and another painting and another painting. And that's kind of where I 
end up. So like recently, a student was talking about maybe the student who is a minority student wanted to make art about transcendence. And, and there was a suggestion that she look at the art of a white guy from art history who makes art about transcendence. But she was like, no, I don't like identify with that because he's not like me. And it brought up the problem, why do you expect us to identify with it when you do it, since we're not like you either? And that's an interesting problem. And those, and I guess I can't resist an interesting problem, and my students bring them to me in the abundance. Do you have an answer? No. <laughs> I'm what they call crazy my cloud. You know? <laughs> Coming up with problems that don't exist. <laughs> yes. I'd love to hear your thoughts on um, I went to the uh, there was an African uh, festival uh, where they were showcasing artists from across the and what fascinated me when I went through it is that almost 100% was Portuguese. I mean, it was all, or a corpse, I can't say, like 90%. So, now I'm going to jump, okay? So, when the jump is, is I see this like everybody has an Instagram, people take selfies all the time. Sending images of themselves, looking at thousands of images. And I think a lot about Toni Morrison's writing about the visual pollution mm -hmm. that is ever present because we get thousands of images from our cell phones, our computers, from things we read, everybody's now reading film, videos, you know, uh, and it's accelerating. And I'm not sure it generates empathy or getting people to pause and look. So that's one problem about that. But the other part of it is, is that the world is burning. Over 50% of the habitat for most of the world's living things is being destroyed. And it feels like the Tower of Babel where we're taking in cell phones. With no self awareness of how we, because I'm saying this because you threatened me with talking about thinking atmospheres. Like <laughs> 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 I can take that literally. But just to freeze, you know, so I just opening it up. It's just, I, I love a good smoke painting. I love a big mess. Um, now, I, I would have to make a leap between your observation about portraiture right. and the kind of imagistic pollution. And I'll open it up to anybody who wants to kind of chime in. Um, somehow I feel that portraiture is super important nowadays. And I feel that because I think artists are right, generally. So if everybody is doing something, it's probably the right thing to do, you know, among artists. Uh, so I feel like there is something about portraiture, and what is portraiture about? I think, because I'm trying to make these portraits, right? And I'm thinking, okay, portraiture is, if I can propose in a picture that that is some individual being, some particular being in a particular moment in its own reality, then I win. That's something a, a smiley face doesn't do. It doesn't propose that this is a particular person at uh, and maybe that's what people are trying to do, is, is portray some particular person in a particular moment in, a, in reality. Um, and maybe that's important to do right now. Um, yeah. But I think, I, I usually think that what artists are struggling with is probably the right thing to be struggling with. I don't think most people are wrong. I usually feel like if anybody's wrong, it would be me if I'm going against what everybody else is interested in. I don't, that, that doesn't help, but. Um, 
are. So if anybody else has any thoughts about image pollution, portraiture, the, the prominence of portraiture among marginalized people who are what they now call visible minorities, maybe. Or opening the gates. Owning the gaze. I'm sorry. I just can't even believe it's William's show. Uh -huh. and it was the opposite. You know, it's kind of just like um, lost your abstraction. Right. Mm -hmm. As identity also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are always the outliers, right? Like people swimming against the stream. I recently heard a, a young female black artist say that non-representational abstract painting categorically is a sign of privilege. What do you think about that? Is she here? No. Because <laughs> <laughs> if she is, I agree with you 100%. Um, now, of course, you know, as a teacher, the first rule of critique is you cannot evoke an imaginary audience. So you have to say that. Can you, can you, Sam Hanna? No, I can't say that. Okay, then you tell me why not. <laughs> why, why is it, I, I, I'd rather say, why abstraction is more inclusive and why it's exclusive. Okay. Because there are archetypal forms and currents and threads in the world that unite us and they can they can be reduced to a, a color palette or a formal spatial scenario on canvas. It doesn't have to be if you just if, I understand her point, but I disagree with it because I would say that um, there are things that are fundamentally united among united, they have to unite all of us, and it's just how we Any other thoughts? Yeah, Eddie Clark. I'm sorry? Eddie Clark, Eddie Clark. I mean, he's a black abstract that um, I knew well in the 80s and 90s, and he, I, I, he would, I don't think he would agree with that statement. I don't agree with it, but. Um. I think it's a very personal statement. I want to know the larger direction that it had, because I just think it's, I mean, it doesn't match up with thousands of African American artists and African American artists I know, but it doesn't go away. The 20th Street African store. I mean, abstraction is totally in the language, you know. Right. Most of the art in the world of history is abstract. Yeah. Um, so, one of the most important books for me on race is a book by John Paul Sartre called Anti Semite and Jew. And he argues that abstraction for marginalized people, abstraction is an inauthentic strategy. Because even though human beings share a basic humanity, as a marginalized person, I've never experienced it. Like maybe when I go home and sit in my bathtub, I experience being a, a human being. But like while I'm standing here right now, I'm experiencing being black, being a man, being this and that in all of my interaction with other human beings, which takes up 90% of my time. And maybe like the project of whiteness is an attempt to make human beings who experience humanity all the time, like who have an experience of individuality, right? Like when a guy shoots up a great school and they say he's the lone wolf. Like this idea of individuality is a, is a thing only a few people can experience for seven or eight hours a day, you know? And marginalized people 
maybe experience it for 30 minutes a day. And so it's not that it's not real, like it's not that our souls are not real, it's just that it might be socially or politically inauthentic uh, to pretend that that's the dominant mode of my existence, is this kind of modernist existential individuality. And I struggle with that. Because I am something of an abstract painter. But I guess I'm also kind of suspicious. Because if a white heterosexual man actually does experience human individuality, then white supremacy worked. And I have the suspicion that it doesn't work. So I have a suspicion that even you have never experienced that individuality. And I think that that's the kind of radical proposition of identity art. I think in the future, all art will be identity art. And it'll be a great idea, and then it'll be a terrible idea. Because also, in the future, all politics may become identity politics. And you know, once white identity politics takes over, once the average white man acts not in his own interest, but in the interest of whiteness, then the game is over, right? But um, does that make any sense, what I just said? Yeah. It's real, but it's also inauthentic to, to claim it in some way. Mm -hmm. So she's right. But I think that she should, rather than just doing the other thing, just, you know, Sartre also mentioned, okay, so abstraction is authentic. He mentioned that what he called masochism. Masochism is like self-objectification. When you just say, you know what? I'm just gonna be a Jew. I'm just gonna be a black person. And I'm gonna give up the struggle for individuality. And I feel like maybe a lot of uh, hip hop artists kind of do that. You know, where you just take on this identity, right? Externalized identity. That's actually an authentic strategy. Like it, you're acknowledging the reality of the world that you live in. But I feel like there's some more complicated authentic strategy too. So for, for artists who have just embraced shared identity and self-objectification, that's authentic. I can't blame you. You're talking about reality. Um, but there are more, there has to be some secret, more complicated strategy solution. Well, that's one reality, which is the identifying, but then, you know, when you Dream, yeah. Uh, or eat, or sleep, or whatever. Um, there's um, all kinds of realities going on. Yeah, and I think that would be great art. I would love to see that painting by a marginalized person who admits that they're only a human being when they eat dinner. When they're not alone. You know, when they're taking a bath, when they're alone at these moments in the day. Well, we hope, we hope that people have this. We can't, are you very pessimistic that um, you were saying in the future you think everything will be identity? You, you, you really, identity politics, you, you really believe that? But then it'll get better. Excuse me? But then it'll get better. Oh. Like, you know, things get bad and then they get better. <laughs> like, that's how it's always been, right? Like the worst thing that always happens. Well, but you cycle all the time. You yeah. cycle and nothing stays still. Yeah. The worst thing always happens. <laughs> I'm, you know, reading Plato's Republic. He talks about how political systems change one into the other. And he says that when wise people are in charge, the thing that wise people do is we avoid problems, right? Mm -hmm. But since we avoid problems, Nobody ever sees the problem. So they want more action in their lives or something like that. So I think that problems can only be avoided for so long before people demand to see it, you know? And then, but it, all problems can be solved through art. <laughs> Especially painting. <laughs> Any 
other question. Yes. Um, I guess I wanted to ask about the why because um, it's always intrigued me because and you touched on it but it never got to the kind of definitions I work with my students that I'm uh, okay um, the word why and for cause it, it, it has two as you began to touch on it, it has two different meanings it can mean how come how did things get here why are they but it also can mean why are you doing it for a future reason. I'm doing it so that you know something will come of it, you know, or I'm doing it because something led to it. So I just kind of wanted to take that take that and put it out there for everybody to get in. Well you're tempting me because yeah. it's actually yeah. one of my favorite subjects Figured. is why. Um, but it would take a really long time and I, I think I would lose the room. But um, so I was reading, there was this uh, interview with the guy who robbed Kim Kardashian in Paris. <laughs> robbed her at that point, Kim Kardashian in Paris. And Vice Magazine does an interview with him. They say, why did you rob her? And he says, I saw her on TV. She like threw some diamonds in a swimming pool. I felt indignation and I wanted to, he didn't do that one, but he felt indignation and he wanted to teach her a lesson. So he had a motive which is a feeling of indignation, and he had a goal, which was to teach her a lesson. But motives and goals are not what we you usually mean by reasons. Reasons are reasonable. So there are reasons. For example, uh, if you rob tourists, they will not come back to the country to, to witness against you, so you won't be prosecuted. Um, tourists don't have any security because they're in hotels, et cetera, et cetera. So reasons are reasons for everybody. Like reasons are something you would tell a group of children who wanted to become thieves. Like this is a good reason to, to do such and such a thing. Motives are how you feel, it's a secret in your heart, and everybody has a right to their motives. You know, like Louise Bourgeois makes these installation pieces with sculpture because she feels shame. She might have felt other things, but whatever she feels, she has a right to those feelings. Um, goals. Uh, this is America. It's covered in the Declaration of Independence that everybody has a right to pursue their own happiness. Everybody has a right to have their own goals. I like reasons, especially in art. For example, I was reading an interview with Martin Currier, and they asked him, uh, how, do you trans how do you transform the spaces that your sculptures are within? And he said, okay, you like, mimic spatial effects that happen in the space. So like uh, converging lines, he would make a ladder that exaggerated convergence. That exaggeration uh, kind of latches on to the real effects of the space, and the space and the object kind of become one and allow you to transform the space through the object. That's a reason. He might have done it because he was beaten as a child by his parents had forbid, or he felt shame, or he felt this, or he felt that. But um, yeah, I, 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 I honor all answers to why, but they are different. And some of them we share, and some of them we just have to respect, you know? Some of them we can argue, but some we just have to accept. Everybody has the right to their inner life. <laughs>